as we go into God's Word, I invite you to open a Bible to Acts chapter 19 as we continue studying the movement of God of the early church to the second half of Acts and what we can learn about Jesus and how we as a church and as individuals can follow him in our lives more closely and powerfully. So as we open our hearts and minds to hear God's word, we begin with prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds to be made still by the Holy Spirit and to be receptive to the message of the gospel of Jesus and his word. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that the Holy Spirit would speak to them the words of God that they need to hear this morning so that they may trust in Jesus more fully. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would preach faithfully and effectively God's word and the message of Jesus for, of salvation for sinners. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So Acts chapter 19, I thank Bob for reading all those fun names for us. I wanted to have the whole chapter read, but it's, it's a long chapter. And the reason is because this is a magnificent story of the church in Ephesus being started by the Apostle Paul. Um, Paul is going from city to city, from metropolitan area to metropolitan area, starting churches, sharing the gospel, and he has a particular rhythm that he usually follows, but when he gets to Ephesus, things change. The, the church in Ephesus doesn't begin with Paul giving a sermon or giving a small group Bible study. The, the church in Ephesus begins with these massive miracles and powerful movements of the Holy Spirit in, in the city and in people's lives to come to faith in Jesus. And so in the first half of Acts 19, there are these men who are itinerant exorcists. I don't know how you get that job, but you know, it'd be pretty impressive to put it on your resume. Like, what'd you do at your last job? I was an itinerant exorcist. I walked around from city to city, place to place, casting out demons. And their names are the sons of Sceva or Siva. And they go from place to place doing this. And eventually, they, they meet a man who is demon-possessed. And they go to do their job, whatever techniques they use. But in this case, they do something differently. They tell the man, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. So Paul showed up, and he is sharing the word of God boldly and courageously. He is unafraid. And so these group of men show up and they tell this demon to leave this man in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches because these men are not Christians. And the demon responds by going, I know who Jesus is and I've heard of Paul. Well, that's pretty impressive that a Words getting around in hell and all the other demons know who Paul is. And then the demon looks at the men and goes, and who are you? It's just not a moment you want to be a part of, right? At that moment, you're just like, we should go. It's not working. And what happens is the demon-possessed man overpowers them and beats them up until they run away naked. Now, this is a wild story. But here's what I want you to see. In Acts 19, it's before our scripture reading the bulletin. In verse 17, this, it says, this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both the Jews and the Greeks, so both Jews and Gentiles, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was exalted. Many of those who are now believers came forward confessing and divulging their practices a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. They counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. So this whole chapter has these awesome miracles, that one and then the one we're about to read where there's the riot and everybody uh, reacts to this. But what I want you to see in it is 
at the heart of this story in this chapter, behind the awesome miracles that we all love, right? Because that's a really great story, right? Uh, a demon is confronted and knows who Paul is, and yet the word of God prevails mightily, and lots and lots of people in this city, both Jews and Greeks, do what? Come to faith in Jesus. How many of you would be like, that's awesome, that's amazing, right? That's the part of the story we love. But at the heart of these two stories here in Acts 19 is something we don't always get excited about. And preachers don't want to really preach about. <laughs> but I'm gonna, because it's here, okay? <laughs> All right, that's why I say open the Bible, because then I have to just do whatever it says. Okay? At the heart of these two stories is idolatry. And people turning away from their idols casting them aside, destroying them, getting rid of them, and turning and trusting in Jesus. Now, I know what you're thinking, because you're lovely, beautiful, Jesus-loving people. You're going, Pastor, of course we want to get rid of our idols, because we're what? We're Christians. How many of you believe in Jesus? You're like, I believe in Jesus. I don't, I'm not worshiping other gods. And so what we do is we love the story where it's like, wow, this demon thing happened and he heard of Paul and yet the word of God mightily prevailed over him and people heard about it and they cast away all of their idolatry stuff, right? They got rid of all of their practices of magic and witchcraft and everything else. And they destroyed it all. They even burned all of it, even though it was super valuable and turned to Jesus. That's amazing. And we can sit there and go, what? It's really good that they did that. <laughs> that they got rid of all that idol stuff and, and burned it all and all that. And then in the scripture reading that we have in our bulletin, in verse 23 begins, about that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. And the phrase in the book of Acts, the way, refers to the church, Christians. They didn't call themselves Christians early on. They called themselves followers of the way because that's what Jesus said he was, the way to the Father, Right? And so they're saying there's no little disturbance, right? That's a fancy way of saying there was a really big <laughs> disturbance in the city. The whole economy is disrupted by what just happened, and it's continuing to happen. And what's continuing to happen in verses 23 through the end of the chapter is that Paul keeps preaching the gospel, and people keep getting rid of their idols and turning to Jesus, and it's turning the whole world upside down. And that's why Luke says in verse 23, there, there actually arose a huge disturbance to the way the world works, the way people were living their lives. And it disrupted everything. It disrupted the way they were living. It disrupted how they worshiped. It disrupted who they worshiped. And then the really big one that we just read about, we're going to read here again, what it really disrupted was their wealth and their income and the economy. So here's the deal. We have to be willing to humble ourselves and admit in our own hearts that I might not have as flamboyant of idols <laughs> like statues of Artemis or a temple of Artemis that I go to or anything like that. I don't have books like they did about magical practices and witchcraft and how to do it to get wealthy. Right? But in my heart, just like them, I have idols. I have things that I would be distraught over if it was disrupted, if it was lost, if it was taken away from me. And I would say, no, I'm losing this thing that gives me everything I think I need and want in life. Now, here's the real tricky part about idolatry as we're going to get into the text. John Calvin, a great theologian, said this way, the human heart is an idol factory. What he meant by that is, you can get rid of one, and be like, oh good, I'm so glad I have moved past this idol, this sin, it's no longer a struggle for me. And then you can wake up the next day and your heart goes, Ch -ch -ch. here's a new one. You're like, oh, this is shiny. I like this one, it's different, right? And you feel good, because you're, what's up? I'm not sitting in that way anymore. Unfortunately, my heart came up with a whole new, different way to worship idols. 
All right, so let us go into this story. Verse 23, about that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way, concerning what Paul is doing, the message of Jesus. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis and brought no little business to the craftsmen. Again, Luke is kind of saying the opposite of saying, he brought a lot of money into the city of Ephesus. This was a huge part of their wealth and their stability and their income and their economics. These, in verse 25, he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. Right? Now, I just, I love the reputation that Paul has garnered, right? It's like, it's not just in our city, it's where? Like everywhere. Like you can't go anywhere. This dude is causing all kinds of problems for us by what? He's convincing people to believe in Jesus and leave behind their idols. Now, what is Demetrius really upset about? The loss of our wealth. Because what is at the heart of wealth? Yes, I understand we usually think of money, but for them, think of it. It provides what for them? All of their power, all of their influence, all of their food, all their clothes, everything, right? In their mind, this is being, this idol, literally an idol factory, is doing what for them in their minds? Giving me everything I need in life. And they're upset because Paul has come along and people are leaving those idols behind and following Jesus. And then, you know, at the end of verse 26, it says this amazing statement. Paul is saying that gods made with hands are not actually gods. Now, how many of you just agree with that? Yeah. Like, if you're a Christian, you're like, yeah, I would agree that these little statues of Artemis are not what? Actual gods. Okay. This is where you and I have to repent. And this is why I was like, I don't like talking about idols, right? Because it's one thing for me to talk about idolatry in the sense of what? How many of you got a statue of Artemis in your house? If you raise your hand, I'm going to visit you later today, okay? Anybody tempted to be like, I'm gonna go find one? Probably not. I would say it's a safe guess on my part, right? So th- we like talking about idolatry. You're okay with the preacher preaching about idolatry if what? It's, it's at a distance. If it's not your idol, right? So if I just spend the rest of the sermon talking about Artemis and how you shouldn't worship Artemis, you should worship Jesus, how many of you, show of hands, come on, participate with me a little bit, would be okay with that? Yeah, fine, I feel good. Good sermon, pastor. Now, what if I start talking about the real idol? Tim Keller, a very amazing theologian who's in heaven now, talked about how we have surface-level idols, but the real problem is the root level, the heart level idols. So on the surface, their idol is, we make statues of Artemis, we have a temple to Artemis, right? The root idol for them is, what he's really concerned about is, we're losing our wealth. We are losing the things of this earth that we find solace and comfort and peace in. And that's what we need to talk about. Because when we realize that, guess what? All of us have idols. Martin Luther defined it this way. He said, whatever your heart trusts in and turns to for comfort in your time of need, he says, that is really and truly your God. That that darn Luther making you have to repent, right? Right? Because there are things, maybe it's not a statue of Artemis, but there are things in this world and in this life that when life presses in on us, when life gets difficult, when circumstances are heavy, 
we do what so often in our idolatrous hearts? We turn to them and go, this thing is what's going to do what for me right now? It's gonna give me comfort. It will give me peace. Maybe it'll give me solace. Or maybe you do the the futuristic idolatry, which is if I could just get to there, then I, I, I have hope because I'm working towards this thing, right? Once I get it, then I will be satisfied. I will be at peace. And so they're upset because the preacher named Paul comes along and says, you need to stop worshiping these things because they're not really gods. They're made with human hands, right? And I understand, I've read it before, and I am a human being that struggles with the same things that you do, right? That when we hear it said that way, we go, well, of course, it's, a, it's not a god. Someone made it, right? But you know what the Bible tells us about ourselves? We're foolish. Isaiah 44 and 46 has some things to say about this. God is very beautifully comforting and loving in the book of Isaiah. Those are other chapters. <laughs> All right, Isaiah 44 and 46, God is angry with his people. You know why? Because they are just, they are acting like the people of Ephesus. They are creating statues and carving images like Artemis and bowing down and worshiping to them. And God is not pleased with this. So a few passages from Isaiah chapter 44 and 46. In Isaiah 44, God says this, all who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit them. Their witnesses neither see nor know what they may be put to shame. Who fashions a god or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing? So God looks at what his people are doing. Now in their case, they were literally acting like the silversmiths in Ephesus. They were, they were carving physical idols, images to bow down to and worship. And God looks at it and says, do you realize how foolish you are? You made it. It can't profit you. It can't benefit you. It can't bring to you the things you need in life. And then in verse, or in chapter 46, he says this to them. He says, listen to me, you people who are stubborn of heart. So you know he's talking to all of us. (laughs) Here's my evidence for that. How many of you have ever confessed a sin in church before? Show of hands. We got confession every week. Come back next week, I'll make you do it again. Because it's good for us. Now here's my follow-up question that's a little more pointed. You don't have to raise your hand for this one, I just want you to think about it. How many of you have confessed a sin in church or privately to God before? And then you came back the next week or the next day and you told God, ah, I gotta apologize and confess the exact same thing all over again. Anybody ever done that? Now, usually when we confess our sins, we're telling God, I'm sorry, I repent of this, I don't wanna do it anymore, I wanna follow Jesus, I wanna receive your forgiveness and live differently, right? That's a good thing. But God's like, yeah, yeah, you're kinda stubborn of heart, though. And because we're stubborn of heart, because we're foolish, we're really good at rushing out the door and struggling with the same sin, bowing down to the same pointless idols all over again. And so God looks at his people, he looks at you and me in Isaiah 46, he says, says, listen to me, which means he wants us to turn to him, listen to his words. You stubborn of heart, you who are far from righteousness, I bring near my righteousness. It is not far off and my salvation will not delay. So God is calling you and I to repent of our idols. He's calling you and I to do what Paul has gone through Ephesus and all of Asia to do, which is realize and confess in our hearts and in our lives that that the gods crafted by hands, 
made by us in our hearts and in our lives are not actually God's. As Isaiah 44 says, can't actually profit us. In right? Isaiah 46, God says this, to whom will you liken me and make me an equal of? Who will you compare me to that we may be alike? Those who lavish gold from the purse and weight out silver in the scales. They hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a god and then they fall down and worship it. He says, that's our problem, right? The things of this world the things that they were struggling with in Ephesus, which really wasn't about Artemis, it was about the wealth that it provided. He's saying, even in ancient Israel, in Isaiah's day, the people of God were doing what? Finding ways to make gods by human hands. He says, here's your problem, you keep bowing down to worship it. Even though, he says, you know, it can't do anything for you. It doesn't actually benefit your life. It doesn't actually profit you, right? How many of you have done what I've done, which is you've had an idol life, you've had something you've striven for, something that you had in your, you set your mind and your heart to, you said, if I could just get this, then like Luther says, I will have all the comfort, all the hope, and all the peace I've been looking for, and you actually got the thing. Anybody actually gotten your idol before? Like you, you actually caught it? You said, I, I have it now. And then felt let down. And you're like, I need to make a better one. And he said, I'm gonna go get a different one. I'm gonna go make a new one, right? And that's the whole point that God is saying. This is why you're stubborn and foolish in your hearts because you know it doesn't work. You know it doesn't fulfill you. You know it's not a real God. And yet, what do we do so often? The next one, the next thing the next relationship, the next whatever, will do what? That will be the one that doesn't let me down, that doesn't disappoint me, that doesn't make me lose hope and comfort and peace in my time of need. So God is saying this to his people. And then he goes on, and you should read the whole, all these chapters when you go home. God is mocking us in our foolishness. He says in Isaiah 46, verse seven, they lift it to their shoulders. They carry it. They set it in its place, and it stands there. So he's like, you built the whole thing, and then you throw a parade where you march it around to show everybody, look at it. Look at it. Look what I have now. Isn't it amazing? He says, you're carrying around. And then he says, but you do this because it cannot move on its own. <laughs> he's like, you realize Look, just to be a little offensive, God is basically saying, you realize how dumb you are right now? Is that blunt enough? I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you realize how foolish you are? You built the thing, you go, this will be the God that saves me. Oh, yeah, how? Well, we're going to carry it everywhere we go because it, it's a brick that can't move on its own. God's like, yeah, that sounds good. Let me know how that works out for you. And then God really hits it home for our hearts when he says this in Isaiah 46, verse seven. If someone cries out to it, it does not answer. If someone cries out to it, it does not save him from his trouble. And that's the problem with idols. They're, they can be shiny, they can be amazing, they can feel like they're gonna give me everything I could ever hope for, all the wealth of Ephesus and all of Asia is being disrupted. I could build the coolest looking thing ever. I could get the best object, the newest thing. And God's saying, yeah, you can get it. But when you cry out to it, it's not gonna answer your prayers. When you look to it, it's not gonna save you in your time of trouble. I heard a theologian say it this way, your idols will not love you back. They're not gonna love you back, guys. You can cry out to them, you can plead with them, but as God's word says, they're not gonna answer you. And they're not gonna save you in your time of trouble. Now, because our God is a loving God, after he rails against his people, he rails against you and me for our foolishness and our stubbornness of hearts. He also gives to us comfort and hope. 
So in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 22, God says this about the idols of our hearts. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. And at the end of Isaiah chapter 46, he says, I will bring my righteousness near to you. It is not far off. My salvation I will not delay. Your idols will not love you back. They will not hear your cries. They will not hear your pleas. They will not answer when you pray to them. And when you cry out to be saved in your time of trouble, they're not going to move because they can't. And then God says, but despite your stubbornness, despite your foolishness, despite all the idols you and I are so amazingly gifted at creating, he says, I've already redeemed you so you can come to me. I love the way he puts it. He doesn't say, hey, come to me and then I'll redeem you. God says, no, I've already done it. I've already redeemed you. If you don't believe Isaiah, believe Paul and Romans, the guy that's causing this whole ruckus in Ephesus, right? In Romans, he says, it's while we're still sinners that he died for us. It's while we're still messing it up that he loved us. So he's saying, if you turn to me, I've already redeemed you. I just, I just want you to come home. I just want you to trust in me and not Artemis or any other God you create and name. And then I love, he says, my, my re- righteousness and my salvation are not far off. They're actually really near to you. Because when we're crying out in our times of trouble, we're grabbing and reaching out and pleading and looking for anything, right? We're grabbing all the idols that we can to fill our hearts, to give us comfort and hope and peace in the times of trouble. We're like, this will save me, this will, and it feels empty and it's not working. God's like, you know, I'm right here. I'm already near to you. He says, the idols will not save you. They cannot move. That's what God's word says in Isaiah 46. And he says, but if you look at my salvation, it will not be delayed. What is he saying? The salvation you're looking for, if you look for it in idols, it will never come. It's impossibly far off because they cannot save you and they cannot move. But if you cry out to me, I'm already near to you. My salvation will not be delayed. And so this is the call, not just for the Ephesians with their idol of Artemis. It's the call of all God's people. It's the call of God to all human hearts saying, I want you to repent. I want you to see the foolishness of your idols, that they're not going to love you back. They're not going to rescue. They're not going to hear your cries. They're not going to save you. But I've already redeemed you. I'm already here with you. My salvation will not be delayed. It is there. So the rest of the story in Acts chapter 19, they don't actually listen to Paul. (laughs) Spoiler alert. (laughs) They don't go, oh, you know what? He's right. Idols are bad. Well, because they're human beings like you and me, right? We'll leave here this morning. Hopefully, you'll leave in agreement with God's word. Idols are bad. And I'll see you next week when we all confess our idolatry. Guess what? all over again. So they don't listen to Paul, but that doesn't stop the message of God's word going forth. So in verse 27, Demetrius, who's complaining, continues his shouts, and he says, and there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world Worship. Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. That was written a long time ago. And he was right. You can change the name of the gods from Artemis to whatever. Right? But at the root of it is idolatry. And at the root of our resistance to repent is the fear that Demetrius has, which is. This trade of ours may become in disrepute, but also, and this is what he's really worried about, the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing. What's his fear? People will find out what? My idol is worthless. 
And I've staked my whole life on it. I've staked my whole image, my reputation, and all the applause I get from the world, and all my wealth, and all my business, everything, Demetrius is saying, I've placed on this idol. And I'm terrified that people will find out it's worthless. It's not, it doesn't count for anything. And this is why the Bible tells us to find our identity in Christ. This is why throughout the scriptures, Paul says, you are in Christ now. When God looks at you, it is Jesus Christ and his goodness and righteousness that he sees, right? Because he's like, you want to be associated with him because he's never going to let you down. People go, oh, you're following Jesus. You're following the way. He's like, yeah, he's actually the one God that doesn't disappoint you that doesn't let you down. He's the one God that actually can hear your cries. He's an answer to them. He's the one God who brings near his salvation that doesn't delay and can come and rescue in your times of trouble. He's the one God who counts for everything while Artemis and all the other gods count for nothing. And so what we need to do in order to actually repent of our idols is humble ourselves enough to be able to say the truth. They are worthless and they count for nothing. Even, as Demetrius says, the great goddess Artemis. They count for nothing. They are worthless. And this is what repentance looks like. And why Paul got in so much trouble in this city is because people were willing to take their statues of Artemis and all their other idols and burn them and destroy them. There's this story of Abraham in the Midrash. Midrash is um, ancient uh, rabbinic parables and essentially commentary and sermons on the Old Testament, or what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. So it's not in your Bible, but they tell wonderful stories and, and make a point. And there's this parable about Abraham um, before we knew him. All right? It's a story about Abraham in his youth before he was called by God, and so they're just telling a parable like, this is what it was like for Abraham, living with his father and his family. And so the story goes that his father, Terah, had an idol store. Right? Just think of like a, a boutique shop on the corner of Rainbow, and he's selling statues and idols, and people can come in and purchase them and take them home. And one day, Terah goes on a journey and leaves Abraham, his eldest son, in charge. And while Abraham is running the shop while his dad is gone, he is angered. He is upset by all the idolatry and all the statues before him. And so the story goes that a, a, a man comes in, wants to purchase them, and he goes, and Abraham doesn't sell, he's a very bad businessman, he doesn't sell him a statue. Instead, he yells at the man and goes, why would you want to buy this? It's just made out of stone and bricks and clay. It's worthless. So the man leaves disappointed because he couldn't buy the idol. And then a few days later, a woman comes in, and she wants to make a sacrifice and an offering to the idols. And so she asks Abraham, which one in here is the biggest God? Which one in here is the most powerful idol and statue? And Abraham gets irate with her, and he yells at her, and he runs her off out of the store because of her idolatry. And while he's sitting there and thinking about it, he looks around. And he sees a statue that is the largest. And so Abraham takes a club, and he goes to the store, and he smashes all of the idols and all of the statues in the store. And then he walks up to the biggest one, and he puts the club in its hands and walks away. And a few days later, his dad comes back to see how the business is going and how his son did managing the store while he was away. And he walks into the store, and he falls on his knees, and he cries out, and he screams because he's ruined all their wealth, much like Demetrius with Artemis. It's all gone. What are we going to do? And so his dad cries out, what happened here? And Abraham runs in and goes, oh, my goodness. What's going on? What happened here? And his dad goes, well, you were running the shop. Like, what happened here? What's going on? Abraham looks at his dad and goes, well, it seems kind of obvious. This woman came in. She wanted to make a, a, a sacrifice, so, and she got into this debate about which God is the best God. And so all the, all the gods in the room got into a big fight about which one deserved the offering and the sacrifice and who's the best one to be worshipped. And Abraham's like, obviously, the big guy over here with the club won. 
And he destroyed all of the other statues. And his dad looks at Abraham and goes, that's impossible. They're just statues. I made them myself. And Abraham looks at his dad and goes, so why do you bow down and worship them? Right, that's the point. We know, verse 26, Paul is saying, and people are turning away, that a great many people are now saying with him, the gods made with hands are not what? Gods. So why do you bow down and worship them? Dear friends, the, the invitation of the gospel is to do what God calls us to do in Isaiah 44 and 46, which is to repent of our stubbornness and our foolishness to acknowledge that the gods that are made with human hands are not actually gods. They will not love me back. They will not hear me when I cry out to them. They will not save me in my time and trouble. But if I turn to Jesus, he is the one God who answers my prayers. He is the one God who hears the pleas of my heart. He is the one God who promises that he's already redeemed me and his salvation will not be delayed. So this is the invitation to you each and every day. Martin Luther famously posted 95 theses, and the first one says that the life of the Christian is to be one that repents daily. Every day to go, I'm turning away from my gods. I'm turning to the one true God who can actually hear my prayers and rescue me and save me in my day of trouble. And that is the God of Paul and of the Bible. His name is Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you forgive our stubborn hearts. You forgive and show mercy to us in our foolishness. That even though we turn to gods that are not really gods, we turn to idols made by human hands, yet you still forgive us, welcome us home, and invite us to enjoy your salvation. May we be like the people of Ephesus and burn and destroy all idols and all false gods in our lives so that may we trust in you and you alone for salvation and comfort and hope. In your name we pray, amen.